Hello? In your pocket. In my pocket. Okay. Yes. Um. Huh? Que ça? Super. So, um, everybody hears me? Everything fine? Okay. Um, so, I'm going to give a talk about macros um, for all of you. Um, and it's quite funny because um, many people came to me and they said, Oh, macros, I'm so interested in that, but I don't understand what it is. <laughs> um, I can't really solve that for you, because to really understand macros, you have to use them for a long time. But I will try to um, give you the motivation to, to find out yourself, okay? Because um, what I think, macros are the killer feature in Hex, and I will try to uh, sell this to you. So let's look a bit about um, what this talk is about. First, we're going to say, uh, why do we want macros at all? <laughs> because uh, it's a valid question. <laughs> um, then we're going to look a bit into how they do what they do. Not too much, but just to give you an idea of what's happening at all. Um, then I'm just going to show you some examples of macro code that is already out there. I mean, it's not going to be exhaustive, but uh, you know, a few things. And then I will try to uh, propose a conclusion for this talk for uh, all of you, but um, we'll see. So, um, yeah, this is, this is something that uh, actually happened a couple of months back on the mailing list. Someone was asking, why do we want that, actually? Um, what, what do they really solve? Um, how do they compose with the rest of the language? How do they work with OOP? Or are they more for functional programming? You know, all these kinds of things. And uh, how do the, I mean, this is a real quote. This was uh, the question. So I would say in about every way you can imagine, macros make your life a lot happier. I mean, it's true for me. I'm very happy doing macro program. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's to answer the last question. Uh, the second question, I would say, um, well, they are completely orthogonal to OOP, so you can, if you don't like OOP in Hex, you don't have to do it. And if you don't like it, you also can use macros that have nothing to do with OOP. I will show a small example going into that direction later. And um, last question is, what problems do macros really solve? And, uh, well, it's more than actually just solving our personal curiosity and having fun. And uh, I will try to um, I will try to impress you now. So please present. <laughs> um, well, not quite yet. Okay. So this is a small um, thing I built in over the last couple of days du during a couple of uh, breaks. And um, okay, what you see here is basically the, the early beginning of a GUI framework. It will resize nicely and uh, has some sort of flow. You can have it in both directions. And it um, has cool bindings. So as you type here, it just, uh, you know, kind of does this thing. And um, I mean, there's a lot of non-macro code in there. But uh, I basically had the ideas for that for the last five years, how to implement these things. Um, with macro, this is like altogether some 400 lines of code, what you see here, so the whole framework and stuff like that. Um, of course, based on a layer of another library of mine, but um, you can really, because, because macros allow you to do powerful things, um, you, can, you can really um, just kind of write down what you, what you think you want to do. And so it makes these kinds of things rather uh, complicated. I thought they were... I thought they were complicated, but they don't necessarily have to be. And then there's another small thing I would like to show. OK, that's that. Um. <laughs> OK, so this has a great idea. Um, here I took an, at an, an attempt. Maybe some people of you know Jade or Hammer. These are uh, hex templating languages. Um, no, these are templating languages in general to create uh, HTML. And I kind of took the Hamlet example of Wikipedia, and I created um, in Hex a 
domain-specific language that basically looks the same way, but is embedded into the language. So for example, you see here, these are some log entries and they have a date. And down here, I reuse, I iterate those entries. I, took, I see when it is posted and I want to format it, which because it is embedded, comes actually right here from using date tools. So you can really kind of use the whole language. And for example, okay, if I were to write this and I try to compile, then it's going to say me that my resolution is too small. <laughs> but it's going to say me there's no field body G and I have that kind of directly in my template language so I can just compile. And um, because it's really just more a, a domain specific language, it can spit out a couple of things. This, for example, generates XML. So uh, maybe we can, we can look at the beautiful JavaScript source. <laughs> okay, apparently we can't. <laughs> okay, well this <laughs> generates normal uh, JavaScript uh, code and there's another generator right now. Which, do you still hear me? Okay, uh, which is called fast, and what this actually does is um, it will assemble all the data in a string buffer. And it's uh, currently, I did some benchmarking, and it's uh, even faster than Templo right now. Um, and it does a lot of optimization. So, for example, it will realize that this whole stuff here is static. So, in the string buffer, it will combine that into one operation. It doesn't actually build much structure, so if one could look at the JavaScript code, <laughs> one would see that actually it's a lot of, lot of strings and you get all those kinds of things uh, for free. So if you just run and compile this. And uh, put this here. Okay, so this is the code that has been generated and this is uh, how, it's, how it's rendered, so to speak. And so these are the, the kinds of things um, we can do with macros. It's just to yeah, give you an idea where this might be um, going. And uh, so uh, other things that you might know and might be using right now is also a standard format for string interpolation. I guess many people have seen that. Um, Sport, which also uses macros now to bring you more type safety and allow some advanced operations, and hex shader language which some of you might know, which um, is also an embedded specific language to write shaders directly in hex if you don't want to write assembly the way Adobe uh, would like you to. Or, well, it's probably the best they could come up with, but uh, <laughs> we got hex, so, uh, and we got Nicola, <laughs> so he uh, did this for us, and it's very pleasant. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the question is, why do we actually want macros? And the answer is, uh, we want expressiveness in the end. We want to write very little code. Uh, we want to have a high signal to noise ratio. We don't, want to, we don't want to write Java, basically. We want to really just, for a single thought, we want to have one single line of code and not 10 and not boilerplates and anything like that. And there's um, two ways to go about this. One is adding language features kind of, and then they get into their way and people are getting confused. There was this great uh, quote about um, C++ operator overloading. I saw C out shifted left hello world times and I decided to stop right there. And <laughs> so this is a dangerous road. I mean, you, ha you have to have uh, language features because otherwise you don't get anything done. Um, but you have to know where to stop or how to restrict them. And uh, the other way to go there is um, to have a lot of extensibility. So for example, if you imagine this as a spectrum, some people might have, has anyone ever toyed with Lisp? Yeah, okay, so uh, not very many features, <laughs> but a hell of a lot of extensibility. And um, this is basically the better road to go down. So what you do, you can kind of bend your language with the language itself, well, ideally, and uh, you can, you can make it do what you want. You can adapt it to your, to your um, 
to your needs. There is an approach called language-oriented programming, where in fact for every problem domain, you just create your domain-specific language, and then you just uh, write your code. And this is, macros are taking us there, because we can really just uh, make things small, concise, easy. So this is why we need them. Okay, so now I'm going to give you a brief overview of how this actually works. Um, so this is how the, this is a very simplified view of the hex compiler. <laughs> Um, of many compilers, in fact, but the hex compiler happens to work uh, about the same way. Um, so you first consume some source code, of course, and um, then it creates an intermediary kind of model of the things that you have, so uh, the analyzed syntax tree and a model of the types that exist and things like that. And then it just goes and, and outputs that to, to whatever your target is. And now, um, since about a year and a half, we've got this bit. Um, and so what macros actually do is, um, okay, I didn't really show that macros also come, come from there, from the source code, but what they do is they operate on those, on those past informations, on, on this on uh, abstract data that you have about, about your code, um, which is different from something like C macros that you might know or other preprocessors who really just um, substitute strings without knowing what they are doing. And so um, a cool thing about this is that you change some things and then the compiler will recheck, does it actually make sense what you are doing? Or, uh, and you cannot generate bad syntax and things like that. So it, it's a lot safer than, for example, the C alternative. So um, there's a lot of text. So macros are basically, as I said, uh, they are actual hex functions, true functions that get executed the way we know functions. And um, what they do, they take an expression or multiple expressions and they transform it into something else. Something else is, again, an expression, of course. Um, uh, that's the most simple macro usage, if you will. Um, they can build enums and classes, so kind of automate a lot of boiler code generation and things like that. Uh, they can even declare whole new types, um, which are not present in your code base at all. Kind of like you could generate random classes if you wanted to. I, there's not much point in that, but uh, you could. <laughs> and of course, uh, which is very interesting for things like code coverage tools or dependency graphs or any kind of things, um, they can pro post process all the declarations that you have in your hex program. They can inspect it. So you could basically um, generate your documentations from within your macros as well if you, if you wanted that. And they always get called in some kind of inspectable context, so you can find out about the things that are going on in your whole uh, program, in your whole uh, code base, and uh, respond accordingly. So you can do very intelligent, very complex things. So this is some very simple code. <laughs> in fact, it is so simple that you don't see much of a difference. <laughs> so we have uh, two functions. Um, one of which is a macro, which is a regular macro function, as I said, but it is prefixed with this, uh, this bit, which is the magic bit. And um, they actually, essentially, you might say they do the same thing because they take something and they return it. Both represent identity, but the top one is actually happening at runtime. So what happens is really at runtime, this code gets executed and it chooses just to do nothing and return something, uh, well, to return the same value. Well, this is a macro, so it will actually consume this expression 5 and will just return it. So at the end, it is as if you had written 5 at the place where it's being called. Okay, so that it's not particularly impressive, but that is really just to see the, 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 the simple difference between them. So, um, and also what you see here, here this is an integer, the type, and here it is something that's an expression. This is how hex represents expression, and we'll have a look at that. And this is basically how it happens. So an, an expression consists of two things, the expression definition, which contains the actual data, we will see that, and a position, um, which is kind of the position where the compiler finds this in your code. So if there's an error, uh, it can say, okay, this error occurred here. 
and then you get accurate error displays, which I showed you, for example, in the uh, example with the template language. I used a field that wasn't there, and the, uh, the IDE was able to say, okay, th this error occurred here, and not just somewhere <laughs> within, within anything, okay? Um, so, okay, and these are some of the expression definitions, and it might look a bit uh, weird or strange to work with, but it's really uh, actually simple, so I'm just going to show. The first one up here is uh, the so-called constant, which I think is a bit misleading. You could think of it as an atom, and above are some valid atoms. So, uh, actually, content constants are valid atoms, but uh, identifiers are as well. So this is basically the, the basic building blocks in your, in your S. And then you see that actually, as you go on, this corresponds rather nicely. So you have a call, and the green bit is the call target. And then you have a parameter list, which is accordingly an array, and so on and so forth. Here you see this, this is an array axis. So you have uh, the target and the index, and so on. OK, but I guess you kind of get the gist. <laughs> so. Um, we will do something a bit more complicated right now. <laughs> um, we want to print Hello World twice, which is also not very, uh, very uh, advanced. But here we see a few of those things in action. So we actually construct a new expression that is a block that dupli duplicates the body that we've been given. So it executes it twice. And uh, it generates this expression at the position of the original expression. So if there were an error, it would map back to that position. Um, so if you were to run this code, it would print you twice hello world um, without actually, um, well, OK, this is not much of an advantage. But uh, if you think about it, it doesn't, for example, have the overhead of looping through those things or the redundancy of having put this thing twice. It has neither of both. So now we're going to <laughs> become a bit more complicated. This is just, uh, if you don't understand tiny bits, it's not so bad, OK? Uh, because this uh, takes some time. But it's just to give you a general idea of, uh, of what can happen if you, if you uh, do it. So there's this. Uh, context class, which I, I spoke about the inspectable context that you have, and uh, it is represented through that. So for example, we want um, a function that will trace hello echo 10 times, or well, an arbitrary amount of times. So first, um, we will look, is this thing, is this, uh, is this count expression here, is it an integer? Which we do by kind of looking at the type of the count, and then it's maybe something good or not. And if it's not, then we can raise an, an error at that position. If you were to put a string here, then it would display, OK, this is not an integer. And then we start, uh, we take the current position. This is just a shortcut. And then we, we take, for example, the, the expression that will become 0. We generate an identifier i. Then we. Um, kind of slowly begin to build up the code around it, because actually such a for loop for you is just this big. But it's a complex data structure, in fact. I mean, it's a, you have many, uh, many sub-expressions in that. You have uh, the thing that you're looping over. You have the body. You have the thing that's iterating. And this is just being generated here, basically. So the loop variable, the loop target, the loop head. And then we finally make a for loop which has that head and that body and return it. And so if you run that code, um, it will just print hello echo 10 times. And you can do like 300 times or anything you want. Um, but again, it's not, um, in this case, you don't have to write the loop by yourself. <laughs> which uh, I think I even used something like that once because I was very lazy. Um, <laughs> although it's not much shorter. But it's just to explain how the context actually is working. So um, what we were doing right here is we were doing a bit of the compiler's work. <laughs> because uh, we can actually say, for example, we want an expression that is an integer. And it greatly simplifies all the above. The rest is the same. It's just a lot less code. And uh, if that's still too much for you, I have created a uh, library for working with macros which uh, will give you 
two ways to write the same code in one line. One is uh, through uh, macro tools, which uses a lot of using. And it says just like make the interval between the expression zero and the count and iterate over it with a body. And this just really happens through using a lot. And uh, there's this other thing which is probably better known from Lisp, which is um, kind of called quasi-quotation. The idea is here, what you see is actually you write the expression that you want to have, and then you just say, okay, this part and this part I want to inject from the outer context. So I don't have to build all this myself. I can just go, okay, I mean, I know what I want. I want to write it down and just fit in my small bits right here. Um, so that's on, on GitHub. It's documented. <laughs> it is. Um, and uh, it's even more or less current, the documentation. <laughs> um, so yes, you can, I mean, if you want to do macros, you can, of course, you're free to do it any way you want it. Um, I ran a lot of them, and this library is quite battle tested. I started it a year and a half ago, about the time when macros came out. And um, there's a couple of projects using it, using it, so I would really claim it's reliable. Um, so with that, this higher level of extraction, we can kind of, oh no, we don't really need to do that. Okay, this is, this is for example, a simple example where you, you can, can just take a string, uh, you can uh, take a string and interpret that as a file position relative to your current file, and you can take its contents and put it directly into your hex code. So that's very nice. If you don't want to pass by resources or load some strings at runtime, you just have some file that has some configuration and what it write in your code as if it were there without actually doing that. Um, this macro will do it for you. So if you say embed string from file, I don't know, something dot txt, then the whole content is going to go there and it's, it's f as if it were a string constant at that position with the content from the file. It's actually quite easy to, to, to do. And this, for example, is um, bulk updating. I know some people of you, uh, there was even a discussion of that on the mailing list a while back, whether we could do this or not. If you want to set multiple properties on an object at the same time, um, one nice way to do this, uh, which is also doable in AS3 and JavaScript, is to take an anonymous object and then you loop through it and then you copy the properties that you find and you put them there. So this, for example, yeah, and many people do this. Um, but this goes through the reflection, so it has a couple of obvious flaws. It isn't type safe, it's slow, and you know, name it. And so you can implement the same thing as a macro. It looks the same way. And what this macro actually will do, it will check whether we have an an inline object declaration here as a parameter, and if so, it will just, you know, build a block of statements that actually extract the expressions that are there and ex assign them. So naturally, the end result is a, is a block that will assign mymc.x to 100, .y to 200, alpha to 0.5. And uh, if you ever type in a property that doesn't exist, it will give you a compile time error. So um, the next thing, and that's something I like to use a lot, is um, Hex allows you to build classes and enums. So um, you basically have a macro that picks up a class declaration or an enum declaration, and you can start uh, adding additional fields, changing fields, things like that. And this all happens with, uh, with data structures that look basically like this. So we have a, a field. The field has a name, documentation, has an axis, which is an array of things like inline, public, static, things like that. It has a type, which is also things you know. You can either have a variable or a property or a function. And it has some metadata, and, and that's basically it. So all the, all the data that exists that is found by the parser is really put into there, and you can work with it and do some, some funky stuff. So this, for example, is a 
Whereas here, what we do is, okay, we uh, write some spelling mistakes. So usually, the compiler would catch that for you if you bothered to compile. <laughs> um, we use this build, uh, this, this first statement up there, um, will actually invoke this macro on the class test. What we'll do, it, it will look at all fields that are there. It iterates them. If they are a function, it will take that function's expression, which is the function body. And it will uh, change that, so it will make a new block. This is an array of statements, which is converted into a block. It will take the ad identifier trace, call it with uh, kind of like before name. So afterwards, if you instantiate a test and you call foo, it will trace before foo and then foo. So this is basically, this is a very simple example, but this is kind of the road you would be going down to if you wanted to implement things like uh, aspect-oriented programming or things like that. You want to inject things. And you can use auto-build. So this was build, as you saw. You can, build, you can use auto-build uh, on a certain class, and then every class that subclasses it or implements it will, uh, will also be built with the same macro. So that's a nice way to, for example, um, to make macro functionality available easily. You don't have to write some sort of cryptic uh, things <laughs> people are afraid of. Um, you just ask your users to implement an interface, and then they get a whole range of, of things for free. So I will sh just show you. I will show you some of this documentation right now. <laughs> um, okay. So basically, this is this is something that works with. Uh, works with auto-build, for example. This, this interface here um, uses this auto-build magic to bring a bit of syntactic sugar to, to the hex language. And uh, people who are on the list might remember there was some uh, wars raging about how properties <laughs> look like in the coming hex versions. Um, and uh, the war is not over. <laughs> uh, but for myself, I've created something that will make it, that makes properties easier for me, which is kind of uh, very similar to, to uh, what Ruby sometimes does to, to generate properties. So this is, these are basically shortcuts that will take a variable and transform it into a full-blown pro property with a default getter and setter and things like that. So you see the code up here will generate the code down there with all the getters and setters and things like that. And it acts rather intelligently. If you have just one thing, then it's used as a guard clause. If you have two, it's a getter and a setter and things like that. And so, um, yeah, you can, you can write things rather well, or rather concisely. And you don't start taking shortcuts because many people sometimes, because they would actually have to implement a property and write an empty setter and an empty getter. Uh, they choose to make the field public, and at some point uh, you would like to change the behavior in a subclass and you can't. So um, with this, it's, um, you can always choose to use public fields, um, but you should do it for the right reasons. And uh, if you have to do it, but you're too lazy to do this, this is a way to accomplish it, basically. Um, although that's going to become better in Hex3, as we've seen yesterday. Um, you saw some rules. This is something many people ask for. For example, if you declare a variable, you want to initialize it directly. Um, Nicola is not fond of that. <laughs> but if you want to do it, <laughs> you can. <laughs> um, so it will do this basically. If you put an underscore, then it comes from the constructor. This is just a constant, and this is, it comes from the constructor, but it's optional. There's a default value and things like that. And this is something. I like quite a lot. I call it syntactic delegation. I think it might make sense. What you basically do is, for example, if you look at this class, which is a stack, it, there's an underlying array. And what we do here is we say we want push, pop, iterator, and length forwarded to it. So what happens at macro time is this generates a push, a pop, iterator, and length 
uh, well, three methods and one property with forwarding things, which basically make make uh, which basically just forward everything to the element to the underlying data structure. So you can so you just expose parts of the array, and you get this quite free. So you don't have to do these things. For example, um, some of you have sometimes coded AS3, I believe. And uh, um, one thing that I had to do often was implement event dispatcher, I event dispatcher, um, which basically looked like you create your, you use a uh, plain vanilla event dispatcher, and then you forward all your calls to it. And uh, with this, you just, re you just have your event dispatcher, and you forward, and you get that all for free. You don't have to do it by foot. Um, there's another example, and you can also use, for example, uh, well, there are some filters. You can also use regular expressions, so, so to say, all fields that start with test or I don't know what, and then just those are going to get forwarded. And down here it becomes kind of crazy, but we'll not cover that. Um, <laughs> we just continue <laughs> right here. Um, okay, and then there's another project. I was okay. I don't have it open, so let's not waste time. Um, there's another project called Hex Operator, yeah, or Hex Op. Um, what it does, it brings operator overloading to Hex. Um, but because it's a macro, you just you really choose um, to have op operator overloading in the scope of a single class. So you don't have kind of uh, several libraries coming and having a battle within your code <laughs> about who gets who gets control of what the plus does to arrays. <laughs> you just really say, okay, this class uses uh, quaternion mathematics, for example, and then you can add quaternions together. Or there is one that overloads uh, plus equals so that you can use it to add handlers to signals and things like that. Okay, you have to choose where you want to, but you can use it at a very granular level and it's also working through um, through this auto build magic that I've shown because it basically you just implement an interface in your class and then the macro gets run and it transforms all your methods if there are operators that don't make sense to the type it will pick that up and will replace that um, yeah and oh yeah that's uh, tink reactive um, this is basically uh, to the things I've shown you, it adds uh, a bindable metadata, and if you use that on a class, okay, on a class that's still to be implemented on a property, then it becomes bindable. So uh, all the boilerplate that will notify people of changes um, is generated for you, like MXML did it, uh, MXMLC, and uh, so yeah, works the same way. So um, you can also uh, use context declare type to declare enums, classes, or, or type types, anything that is there. Um, and you can lose this for a lot of things. Um, this is just a very crazy idea. <laughs> what you can basically do is uh, there's somewhere in the hex uh, code base there's an AS3 parser. What you can do at macro time, you can uh, use that parser to pass some AS3 source code. And you could uh, use context declare type to declare hex classes out of that on the fly. So during compilation, you can include hex classes if, if you wanted to. I mean, it's a very crazy idea. But uh, having some XML-based uh, descriptive language, something like that, makes a lot of sense, basically. You can, you can take an XML, you load it, and you generate a, a class out of that because it's, it's faster than kind of looking into an, a past XML at runtime. Um, but I will not, I'm not doing anything of this right now, so I can show you examples, but that's to uh, give you some crazy ideas. Um, in fact, this feature I used um, because of the slow speed of uh, anonymous functions on Flash and C++. Um, I used it in my tweening engine to try to get more speed out of it, so instead of using anonymous functions, um, I, I had extra classes that kind of did the tweening, functor object, and uh, I was pooling them and things like that. And you can, you can really just generate those on the fly, and it allows you a lot of cool things when you really need it. 
So, yes, and this is something, the last thing I was saying, um, you can post-process all the information that you have. Um, there's a lot of text to take in, but you can generate a lot of things from that. So basically, at the end, before the compiler kind of flushes out <laughs> all the results, um, you can really just uh, look at all the things that are there, and you can do some funny things. Uh, this is legacy since yesterday, legacy code. Um, before, there was no uh, cross-platform implementation for property reflection. Um, this is a macro that basically does what you need. It will, you see, um, this is a suitable parameter for context and generate. It will consume all the types. It will look into those types. If they are a class, then it will get that class. If it's not an interface, it will go through all the fields. And it will basically look at the read and write access, and it will store this into the metadata, basically, down here. So without <laughs> looking at it, uh, line by line. That's what it does, and the metadata persists until runtime. And at runtime, if you need to do a property reflection, you can look into the metadata, you, you can look at an object, you find its class, you look at the metadata, and then you can call the, the actual accessor. And so they work. And if you slap a ca cache onto it, it's actually very fast, but uh, generates a bit of code. Um, so a couple of projects I wanted to show that, that um, also use this, use, use macros in general. Um, okay, this one, the first one I have posted, I've written using macros a type safe tween engine. So if you try to tween property that is not there, it will throw an error. It also does some sorts of optimizations with factor objects that you generate on the fly. Um, Currently, it's slower than using <laughs> anonymous functions. Amazing, on Flash, it's slower. I don't know why. I have to look into that. Um, and it does, oh, maybe I just, I just show it. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's because it's there. I see nothing. So, I think it's here. Okay, this takes a while to compile. Ah, okay, it's here. <laughs> Ta-da! Okay, so um, this is a normal tweeting engine, as you know, and then um, what is quite special about it is because it uses macros, you can, you can rather easily um, add plug-ins, things like these, like with blur filters and stuff like that. Um, many tweeting engines do that, but they kind of had this rooted in their code base. And the way this works in this engine is because it's at macro time. Um, when, a, when you try to tween a property that it's not there, um, it will look into the, into the plugins that are compiled by means of import or about any kind of dependency that you introduce. And it will try to resolve that problem with that plugin. So you don't, uh, so basically as soon as a plugin gets compiled because you import it, um, it gets picked up by the engine. And so, but uh, the engine itself is kept really clean and you can, you can add new plugins without changing the, the engine code at all. Um, so yeah, that's that. Oh, and the engine in principle, it also happens to work on PHP. <laughs> In the sense that you don't have time, but you can start tweens on objects, and then you can advance time manually, and we'll just uh, update the properties, and you can just look at them and see it, that uh, well, the, pro the values are correct. Whether they make sense is up to you to, <laughs> to judge. Um, yeah, so there's uh, select HX and select XML. I believe uh, James covered that a bit yesterday. Uh, you use that in DOM tools? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm going to port it into DOM tools at last. So all the 3D snaps, which are the 3D transforms that get imported. Yeah, so just to get you back the gist of things, um, this, is, uh, this is basically what select hacks looks like. You just have a, a CSS selector. You, you say you select it, 
and then based on a lot of information it has, it will really tell, okay, this is not a bunch of uh, HTML nodes. It's really, uh, these are paragraphs in that case, I believe. And it will, it will really understand that. And you don't have to do any casts, and it's all very type safe. And basically, this is a nice way to, um, to start out with to um, uh, build something like DOM tools, in fact. Yeah. I think you could use it as a way of automatically defining the right type for which, because we've got the type desk. Yeah. So a nice way to use DOM tools to automatically recognize the type desk and then embed it all at runtime. Yeah. So and so, yeah, and, then it, and it's a good basis to get uh, started on something like DOM tools or uh, a hacks comp. Uh, hacks equivalent of jQuery that kind of doesn't do all this kind of overloaded jQuery stuff, which is nice, but doesn't really work with our language. But to do something uh, clean and just as expressive and safe, and uh, I think it's basically uh, doable. Um, there's the same thing for XMLs where you can do this with XMLs and you can add some additional type information. So you can say um, you have, oh, that's an example here. So for example, you can define, okay, this is, this is my XML format and it's also documented. Um, and then you can start uh, querying on those things and it, it stays type safe basically. So um, maybe there's ways to generate this from DTDs or something like that. Uh, not has, it has not been done yet, but it sure can be. And it's a nice way if you, if you just want to interface with an XML API, or let's say if you have to interface with an XML API, um, you can just really uh, Describe it in type depths, and then you can go extract things, and you will get uh, you will get it in the right type. Um, okay, what else? Uh, Scots. I guess some people know Scots. I hope. Yes. No. Okay, Scots is uh, a bit crazy. I w can't claim that I fully understand it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, a cool library uh, if you like. Um, very terse syntax. Um, it has some sorts of Pythonic uh, comprehensions and things like that. So this, uh, it looks a bit like Egyptian to me as well. <laughs> but uh, it's cool. <laughs> okay, and if you if you're used to this kind of language, um, you can use that in Hex. If you don't like it. Um, if it's too complicated for you, um, don't. You don't have to. Um, but you, you can, without uh, forcing Nicola to implement crazy things. <laughs> um, there's uh, Monax as well, which basically uh, brings uh, Haskell monads to, um, to hacks, or let's say the, the general idea. Um, and these two are two things I'm currently working on. Um, I will maybe, uh, I'll try to show this a bit. Five minutes, okay. We're almost there. Um, so, yes. Okay, this is some more code for a change. Okay, so this is, uh, you all know SPOT, I suppose. Um, this is something a bit similar, but it's not object-oriented at all. What uh, this project attempts is to bring um, the relational database model di directly into Hex without passing by objects. Because sometimes that's a bit kind of a leaky abstraction because it's kind of, I mean, you have on the one side you have rigid tables and on the other side you have kind of like the cool mushy things objects do and you would like to have and some polymorphism and things like that. It doesn't work so well together. Um, so much like you would do in SPOT, you kind of define your, your structure and then you can go start querying. So for example, you can say and users select this stuff. It's not very much. Um, but it will basically generate the SQL query and I've asked for the type here. Come on. And it will say, okay, this, the type of this is it has a status that is an int and a name that is a string, which uh, quite well corresponds with what you find here. 
And so it's type safe, but what it really does is it just sends off the, it builds the SQL query, it sends it to the server, and it gives you back the object almost untouched without build, uh, pushing it into a whole instance and things like that. And uh, if you think of it, SQL, well, the model of SQL is actually nice. The language is a bit weird, and the error reporting is useless. <laughs> But it's actually a clever idea, and uh, um, I'm trying to bring that to, to Hex a bit, which is what Link and C Sharp is also about. And I'm kind of working down that road. Um, so, yeah, I will be sure to notice you when it's done. And there's this bit in front, which is basically, I won't show it, but it's a uh, bit like Lambda. But it's macro-based, so you can do, write these kinds of expressions on arrays and things like that. Um, without any runtime overhead. In some cases, it's even faster than handwritten code. But I don't understand myself why that happened. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, to draw the conclusion, so what's important about macros is um, they allow us uh, type safe meta programming. So we can write code that modifies our own code, but it all stays. Uh, in the safe harbor of <laughs> the hex compiler, uh, it will do us if we. It will tell us if we do something really strange, and it can bring type safety to our very uh, small uh, dynamic uh, to our small uh, embedded domain-specific languages that we that we use for all sorts of things. I mean, you might not always call it like that, but you often create models that are that um, bring a lot of semantics with very little code, but sometimes you have the problem that it just, at runtime, it crashes because you made a typo or something like that, and uh, you can totally avoid that with macros. Um, and so, um, what I would uh, like you to do is uh, to try macros yourself. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's like totally worth it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Um, there's not many languages that have a Lisp-like macros with type safety. I think Numerly is currently the only other that has it, but Scala is working on something. Um, there's not so many. This is a new area. Um, we like reinventing the wheel. Uh, this is uh, a place where you can actually invent the wheel for a change. Yeah, um, It's fun. <laughs> if nothing else, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you don't have time for all that, then uh, still please uh, kind of contribute ideas because the thing about macros is if you can imagine it, uh, you can write a macro. <laughs> <laughs> you really can. I mean, it's uh, with a few restrictions, it's really that. Um, or, yeah, just please uh, use the macro based libraries I, I showed you because then they will become a lot better, more reliable. Um, most of them are already, or well, parts of them are. <laughs> um, and just give uh, us feedback. There's a couple of people in the Hex community who are really into macros, and we are trying to uh, push this forward, build some crazy things that are fast, safe, concise, and you really just do small things. And um, yeah, in the end, I think it's also time for us to, to think about how we use Hex. Because it is really possible as of, well, as of quite some time ago, but we, it took us long to realize, I think, at least me. Um, we can really change a lot of, lot of things in the way we make them, because we can really create uh, small, concise languages to do, to do other things. So we don't necessarily need all those kind of enterprise-ish, super professional uh, code coverage, I don't know what tool. I mean, those are great tools. Um, but we might not need them as often as that if our code base is shrunk to a third, a tenth sometimes. And uh, we can do this. I believe we can. <laughs> so any questions? Yes, um, okay, Philippe, first. Um, let's, let's imagine instead of defining the AST, you want to extract information from 
the code. I'm thinking obviously in terms of uh, IDEs where you might want to run an, a dummy compilation mm -hmm. to extract uh, typed information. From yeah, for, for completion support and things like that. So um, instead, so instead of outputting the XMLs, you would, you would want to uh, output uh, something completely different. Um, well, you can do that. I mean, I try to cover. <laughs> no, you can do a macro for that. I try to kind of uh, get this idea across here. You can really. Um, before the generation, um, you have all this information and you can write a macro this, that does this for you. So it can really uh, take all the classes or just some classes from some packages and it will give you the information in any form you might want. It's up to you to, to write it that way that, that you get what you really need. Does that answer your question? Yeah. For instance, so, so, so yeah, you, you could like I mean if you take the sample code this just really extracts all all fields that are that have accesses, but it's just as simple to extract all types that are classes and but, but then you you're doing some context to make expressions. Yeah. It's not really outputting something. You can write files. Yeah, you can write files. You, oh yeah, yes, you can write files. Yeah, you can write Yes, uh, I didn't mention that, but it's basically the the macros uh, run on on something that is very similar to the Nico VM. You can almost always assume it is the Nico VM, and you have most of the APIs. I, I don't know how to stop the generation, but you can always throw in errors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Code can, uh, do different types like JS. Uh, okay, but no, can you get the class information just for a particular target? You get the class information for the target that you are currently compiling for. Cool. So be the whole of that. So, so whatever cool. compile time flex you set, whatever your platform is, it's just this branch that is going to be passed, and therefore it's just that information that you're going to have. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay, uh, Justin. Yeah, just a simple question probably. When, when you use macros, mm -hmm. um, it goes through that intermediate stage. How do you get that? Do you get to see the intermediate stage? Where, like, so, if you want to test whether it was doing what you thought it was doing, yeah. how do you see what it's doing before it goes to the decompile? Um, testing macros. Testing macros, is this a bit tricky? Yes. So can you get a printout? Yeah, of the um, I have. Well, you have to do this by hand, basically. You can just uh, use standard string to flush it out, but you, it's like this. Um, but there's a number of libraries that will basically just uh, take an expression and make readable hex code from it, and you just look at it. And Tinkerbell also has that. You just have expression to string, and macro tools also has it, I think. Yeah. So I think there's four implementations for that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> um, one other question, which relates to compilers and IDEs. Okay, if I've got my code and I've got all these lovely macros, I might not have implemented these macros in my library. So my query is, uh, and I'm not really into macros, I haven't really, I just, I'd like to get into it. So not I'm yet, not okay. Yet, I will be. Um, is, if you've got, someone's got like five outputs, how in an IDE when they don't they, they need to inject those macro calls to go through your code to find like the type information? How would you go about doing that? Because they would actually need to inject those macros into your code somewhere. Um, so well, there's a couple of ways to uh, to call macros. There's the natural one. They occur somehow in code that gets compiled, so they get executed. 
And the other one is you can add a macro call to the compiler as a parameter. You can say invoke this macro during the build process and then it will do whatever you want it to do. Okay? Any more questions? Yeah? Can anyone answer the difference with some of the expression types would be the most confusing thing about macros? I'm sorry. All different enums for all the different expressions. Yes? Can anyone explain the difference between display and display new? Oh yes, I would like to know that. <laughs> E display, e display new is I don't know if it's in a constructor or something like that. E display new. Uh, e display is a uh, yeah it's uh, e display is about the foundation. Yes, and e display new gets used. Constructor parameters basically. Yeah. Okay, well that's what I so figured, yeah. but. Uh, Yeah. No, but the distinction wasn't quite clear between e display and e display new yeah, and things yeah. like that. But I think in fact that every single one of those types had an example of it. That's what I was, that's how I got through. I just kind of stepped through code and just tick them off as I went. Yeah. Yeah, there's, no, there's no way to get completion for the constructor and the. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's how right. I got. I just went, okay, I'll handle it. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So now we all know. Uh, yes, Yannick? Uh, could you uh, build a new app target using macros? Um, you could. Um, <laughs> should you? Um, it's a great, no, it's a, seriously, it's a great way to uh, prototype this. I mean, I don't know whether it's a great way to prototype it, but um, if you are not like into uh, starting with OCaml tomorrow, but uh, you feel that macros are easier, <laughs> which is a kind of the position I was in, um, then you could essentially now decide to, to build a target. You, you have all the information. And uh, recently, there has been, in fact, a change. You can uh, use the type expression and then start traversing. Just until recently, they were fully opaque to you, basically. But now you can really look into it, and you can go and generate it all. A lot of things. Yeah. Yes. It's huge. It's an emulator. It's running inside the compiler, right? It's emulating the Lego VM. It's running quite surprisingly quite fast, and uh, it's not native. And uh, so you have to be careful not to do like a lot of calculus. In general, it's quite fast enough. But uh, the thing is that uh, you need to, before running the macro itself, uh, you need to kind of type all the macro class and initialize them. Before yeah. the compiler cache helps, kind of helps there because you can cache your yeah. typing macros class. Uh, in some cases, it's important. But <laughs> and, is it, and we are planning at some point to also be able to have kind of persistent macro context across compilations uh, that you okay. can kind of <laughs> okay, um, any more questions? Yes, yeah, Alex. Um, is it possible to open socket, for example? Do you have a full Miko capability? Or yeah. yeah? Uh, is it available? Basically, yes. Questions? There are some things that don't. Yeah, or um, maybe. You can do HTTP in your, ma in your macro. I think uh, SQLite doesn't what, work. But what, <laughs> would, the, would the overhead be massive compared to, say, writing a file? Oh, I mean. Depends on the server. Depends on the server, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, local. <coughs> yes. It should, local. yeah. Well, if it's badly implemented. Um, yeah. Yeah, you think it'd be faster, okay. Yeah, interesting. Okay, anybody else? Okay. And a macro get all the imports in a module, basically. Yeah, can you tell with the 
Um, well, there's, uh, you can tell whether something is imported um, in a very uh, brute way by um, generating an expression that, that, is, that will evaluate to this class without the full path. Then you can ask the typer to type it. <laughs> and if it fails, it's not imported. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you could expand it so that it could pull from or Yeah, currently imports and using are not uh, really exposed to uh, to macros. It, it um, very nice also, uh, <laughs> if we could uh, add a hook for when a type is not found. Yes, not that would be really great. <laughs> okay, any other questions? No? Okay, then uh, thank you very much.